If you're British, this film is about you, every one of you. Something is happening in Britain which increasingly intrudes into the way you live. Traditional customs, familiar and trusted patterns of a liberal, compassionate society, the British way of doing things, all are disappearing and being replaced by a frustrating avalanche of alien regulation and bureaucracy. This is happening not as a result of popular demand, but as a result of British membership of the European Union. The very character of our unique way of life is being destroyed, and there has been no public debate, consultation, or approval. The people appearing in this film are not politicians or civil servants. They don't seek your vote or your money. They only ask that for a few moments you watch and listen and then make up your own mind. Almost all you're about to hear has been hidden from you. Everything you're about to hear is the truth. For the last 34 years, British politicians have been hiding from you the fact that they have been handing over the governance of your country to Brussels. This film shows how close they are to completing that process. In 1972, the British people were told that they were joining something called the Common Market. They were assured by Prime Minister Edward Heath that this was just a trading arrangement and involved no loss of essential national sovereignty. In this, the British nation was seriously and deliberately deceived. Today, as a result of that 1972 arrangement, British national identity, a British government and British independence are about to be sacrificed. Britain is to disappear within a European federal state and the British people are to be governed from Brussels by unelected foreign officials. A succession of British politicians have continued that 1972 deceit and secretly stripped Britain of self-government. Details of this whole process have been suppressed and kept from you. Most people in Britain haven't a clue as to what is happening. Christopher Booker explains why. One of the most remarkable things about the European Union is how ignorant people are as to how it came about. A few years ago, when my colleague Richard North and I began researching the history of what is called the European Project, we were astonished to find just how distorted and inaccurate all previous accounts of this story had been. The core ideas which have inspired this project go back to the 1920s, and for the men behind it, notably the Frenchman Jean Monnet, their ultimate goal, right from the start, was to create a United States of Europe. Their aim was to place the peoples of Europe under a form of government like nothing the world had seen before, a government that was supranational. To achieve their goal, they came up with two brilliantly clever ideas. The first was that it could never be achieved overnight. It would have to be assembled piece by piece over many years without revealing its ultimate purpose. The other idea was that all the national governments of Europe should be left in place, while being gradually hollowed out from within, as they passed under ever greater control by the supranational power. Thus, what amounted to a slow-motion coup d'etat could take place without people realising what was happening. That is why we called our story The Great Deception, because such is what the historical evidence shows it to have been. Step one in the early 1950s was Monet's European Coal and Steel Community. He never intended this body to be anything other than the embryo of what would eventually be a government for Europe. The next step was to widen this into a European Economic Community set up by the Treaty of Rome in 1957. 
Again, this common market was deliberately intended to be just a cover for their true goal of complete political union. For nearly 30 years, the handing over of powers by national governments continued, the original six countries becoming 12, until in the 1980s the project was ready for its next great leap forward. This would need two new treaties, the Single European Act in 1986 and the Maastricht Treaty on European Union in 1992, followed in 1997 and 2001 by two more at Amsterdam and Nice. By now the real aims were coming out ever more into the open, as it was agreed that this new supranational government should have its own currency, its own foreign and defence policies, its own court system and police force, all the attributes of a sovereign state. Finally, as the number of member countries rose to 25, it was agreed that as the next great symbolic act in the story, Europe must have its own constitution. In 2005, as we know, this was rejected by the voters of France and Holland. But by now, the project is so far advanced that those behind it believe it must roll on regardless. As we finally wake up to their real aim, how much longer can the wishes of the people of Europe be ignored? Such is the battle in which today, whether we like it or not, we are all involved. The EU constitution Christopher Booker referred to is a major step in the final transfer of power from Westminster to Brussels. But it's more than that. It will mean imposing on the British people a continental view of freedom where nothing is allowed unless the law says so. In Britain, we are free-born from the moment of our birth, able to do anything unless the law prohibits. In the European Union, we are about to lose that. Britain already has a constitution of its own, one that has stood the test of time and been admired and copied by other countries, in particular America, whose founding fathers used the British model when drafting their own constitution. Is it so important that we retain our own constitution? What's so special about it? Here's John Bingley. A constitution should define the relationship between the governance of a nation and its people, setting limitations on power and providing the people with safeguards that protect them by securing the means of redress and remedy. We most certainly do have a British constitution and it does just that. Our constitution has evolved over many centuries and consists of much written law. The best known examples are the Magna Carta in 1215 and the Declaration and Bill of Rights of 1688-9. In Britain we are governed according to the rule of law. The rules contained in our constitution define how we must be governed. Primarily the coronation oath stipulates the rule of law as the only means of our lawful governance and places limitations on the use of executive power. Those limitations stop the divine right of kings. There ought to be no divine right of politicians either. In short, the British Constitution and the rule of law provide a framework for government by creating boundaries and constraints on the exercise of power. Dictatorial power can only come about when the ruler has both the power to make the law and to enforce it. Mussolini, Hitler and Stalin all achieved this total authority, resulting in staggering bloodshed. Our unique British constitution prevents such unification of power taking place. Some vital principles of our constitution are the right to jury trial, the right of habeas corpus, the presumption of innocence, the right to silence, no taxation without representation, no cruel and unusual punishments. All these principles and others are at the core of our constitution and integral to our liberty with a separation of powers as the safeguarding mechanism at its heart. It is entirely different from the continental system of administration and the proposed EU constitution, where nothing is allowed unless the law permits. Our ancient constitution determines that the duty of our politicians is to maintain our liberty. Liberty is the norm in Britain and is only constrained by the law. We British are free to do anything unless the law prohibits. The British Constitution has prevented the worst excesses of tyranny or despotism for centuries. Why should we wish to exchange this for a system which supports the unelected, 
the irremovable and the unaccountable. The imposition of the EU constitution will mean the end of the British constitution and along with it will go all the protections we have enjoyed for centuries, including our right and our children's right of self-determination. In addition to bringing about the end of our unique British form of freedom, the EU constitution transfers significant political power to Brussels. This, together with the combined losses brought about by the five treaties, means that the British people will no longer be free to govern themselves. We are close to the end game. But the EU constitution, we were informed, could only be implemented if all 25 countries ratified it. Christopher Booker has been examining whether or not that condition has been observed and what the EU constitution really means. It was in the late 1990s that the political leaders of the European Union began to talk about the need to give Europe a constitution. For decades they had been proceeding with their plan to assemble a supranational government for Europe by stealth. But they had got so far, they now felt, that concealment was no longer necessary. If the United States had a constitution, so should the new United States of Europe. In 2002, delegates from 25 countries met for 15 months in Brussels to draft the new constitution, very much guided by their chairman, Giscard d'Estaing, the former president of France. It then took their governments another year to agree on the final text, this huge document here. The original American constitution had just seven articles. This constitution for Europe contains 448 which originally covered 800 pages. In some ways, this constitution is just another treaty because it incorporates all the earlier treaties, but it makes the intention to set up a European government much more obvious than ever before. It gives the European Union, the Union as they now call it, pretty well all the attributes of a fully fledged state with its own flag, its own currency, its own foreign and defense policies, its own courts and legal officers, its own federal police force. It gives the Union, for the first time, its own legal personality, with the right to behave on the international stage just like any sovereign government. It recognises for the first time in a treaty the principle that the laws of the Union are superior in every respect to those made by national parliaments and courts. It marks a further massive handing over of powers from national governments to the central government in Brussels. It greatly extends the areas of life where Brussels has the power to dictate policies and laws. It also reduces, almost to vanishing point, the right of national governments to veto laws which they do not consider in their country's interests. It includes all the 54 articles of the so-called Charter of Fundamental Rights, the document which we were told by a British minister would have no more legal significance than a copy of the Sun newspaper or the Beano. What this document confirms, in short, is the desire to set up a supranational government which is not elected and which the peoples of Europe cannot call to account or dismiss. It marks the transformation of Europe, in effect, into a one-party state. Yet this is what the governments of Europe agreed to in our name in 2004. Only in 2005, when it was rejected by the voters of France and Holland, did the plan to impose this constitution on us all at last run into a mighty obstacle. For the moment, it has been put on ice, but there are plenty of people at the top in Europe who are looking for ways to bring it back onto the agenda. Meanwhile, they are already pushing ahead with many of its contents, from a European space program to a common defence policy, just as if their constitution was already legally in force. They are not going to give up. The EU constitution sweeps up those few areas of governmental power that still, just about, remain British. But what about our economy? Whoever controls the currency controls the country. And at the moment we still have our own currency, the pound sterling. Signing up to the EU constitution would undoubtedly increase the pressure on Britain to enter the single currency.
This would mean Britain's economy being controlled by the foreign bankers of the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. Ian Milne has been looking at EU economics. There's a huge misconception that the EU political economic model represents the future. Big mistake. Let me explain. The EU model is copied nowhere in the developed world. The relatively few customs unions that do exist are in poor African and Latin American countries, former Soviet satellites and some of the Gulf states. But outside Europe, no major industrial trading nation, not the USA, not Japan, not South Korea, not Singapore, not Australia, not Chile, has chosen to conduct its trade via an EU-type customs union and single market. Neither, and here's the killer fact, have tomorrow's economic giants, China and India. All have chosen user-friendly, light-touch, government-to-government arrangements. That's the future, trade-wise. The claim that the UK needs the EU for its trade and jobs is an empty one. Over 90% of the UK economy is not involved in exporting to the EU. The USA, not in the EU, sells more to the EU than the UK does, without paying a penny to Brussels or imposing one ounce of EU regulation on the US economy. The UK has a huge and growing deficit on its trade with continental Europe, and the cost of UK membership of the EU massively outweighs the benefit. British access to the 6% of the world's population living in the EU costs us a fortune. The Treasury hands over a quarter of a billion pounds of our taxes to Brussels every single week. British access to the other 94% of the world's population outside the EU is free. The fact is, the EU is the past, invented in the 1950s to meet the failures of the 1930s. But in tomorrow's world, it'll soon be an irrelevance, overshadowed by the USA, China and India, all of which, as it happens, conduct their business in English. Those are the countries we have to be free to engage with, as equals, to build a better world in the 21st century. It's time this country got out and embraced the future. So our political power has been handed away, our constitutional power is planned to go, and our economic power is being seriously threatened. All this was planned and must happen if the EU is to control us completely. But that isn't enough. Everything that is British must go, and that's where local government plays its part in dismantling the British state. Part of the political takeover is the hollowing out process Christopher Booker spoke of earlier, and the pretense that our Parliament still governs Britain, whilst in reality it is merely the puppet of Brussels. Eventually, Westminster will cease to exist, and 12 regional governments, answerable to Brussels, will take over. This breakup of Britain has been investigated by Lindsay Jenkins. For generations, we in the United Kingdom have enjoyed democratic local government. We've elected councillors for our town or county councils. Many of us have volunteered to be parish councillors, unpaid to do our bit for the village. But within a year or two, it will all be gone. Most of it has gone already. The Treaty of Rome was the death knell for democratic government. Today, county, borough and parish councils are all giving way to regions, to sub-regions and sub-sub-regions. The European Union's system of local government. But it's taken time to destroy what was British and replace it with the European model. John Major began the rot with government offices in the regions, new divisions never before known in this country. But when Tony Blair won that landslide victory in 1997, the destruction accelerated. London, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland now have their own elected assemblies. The one in Edinburgh is grandly called a parliament. They may think they have a large measure of independence and freedom, but each is just a region in the European Union. And what about the rest of England? That's divided into eight regions, the South West, the South East, the East Midlands and so on. 
but with appointed assemblies. When people in the North East gave a resounding thumbs down to an elected assembly, the appointed assembly just carried on regardless. But assemblies don't matter. Elected or not, they're just wallpaper. One assembly member told me that he got his massive pile of papers just days before a meeting, and he had no real idea of what was going on. Only the few who drive this process know. They're the assembly officers, the permanent staff, confident, powerful, professional. They're the real power breakers. It's a charade of democracy. The new regions are getting more and more power. Planning. How we can use our land, British land, has already been removed from elected local and county councils and is directed from Brussels. Every region's plans now have to fit into the Brussels plan. Soon it will be the turn of the police and their new super regional forces. Will they answer to the European Union's police force, Europol, in The Hague? Soon London will be just a regional capital and not a focus of the nation state, because there won't be a nation state, just a collection of European regions. Britain will have disappeared. As you have seen, since 1972, the balkanization of Britain into 12 EU provinces has continued apace, so that today the process of deconstructing Britain is almost complete. And there is nothing our politicians seem willing to do about it, albeit that it is in defiance of our own constitution. So, is this the end of Britain and the right of the British to govern themselves? Is EU membership, as some would have you believe, inevitable? And is there an alternative to being part of a European federal state? Well, here are two views of the future from two very different standpoints. First, Ian Milne again. The story of the next 50 years is going to be the rise and rise of the world outside the EU where the other 94% of the population of the planet lives. In that vibrant, growing 94%, the independent, self-governing nation is the rule, not the exception. Our English-speaking cousins in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Singapore, are proud to be self-governing nations. The world's second biggest economy, Japan, is proud to be a self-governing nation. So are those coming superpowers, China and India. For all these countries, big and small, the idea of surrendering the power to govern themselves, as Britain has done, to a supranational bureaucracy and a corrupt one at that, is literally incomprehensible. We're the third biggest trading nation in the world, ahead of Japan, and the fifth biggest economy in the world. We're the headquarters of the Commonwealth, that voluntary association of English-speaking, self-governing nations, with members on six continents and almost a third of global population. So the claim that we'd be isolated outside the EU is pure, unadulterated nonsense. Just think of the benefits of reclaiming our independence by leaving the EU and joining that growing 94% of the world. First, trade. We already do 50% more of our trade outside the EU than with the EU and our exports outside the EU are growing faster than our exports to the EU. We'd focus on the Asia-Pacific region, which is currently growing five times as fast as the EU. We'd resume our seat and vote at the World Trade Organization. We'd resume our trading alliances with our friends in the Commonwealth. And we'd strike up new ones with the Asian Tigers. Not least, free of the immoral EU common agricultural policy, we'd help the poorest nations in the world by offering them free access to our own markets. Second, defence. It's NATO that's kept the peace in Europe, not the EU. Free of the EU, we'd be able once again to refocus our efforts on NATO, not as at present on the European army that the French and Germans are determined to foist on us. Third, we save huge amounts of our own taxpayers' money. No longer will we hand over £13 billion a year to the EU, a sum that would buy us a dozen new hospitals or four new aircraft carriers every year. And, as the Chancellor has admitted, 
we'd save an awful lot more by throwing off the burden of regulation we don't need and by being outside the ruinous common agricultural policy. But most important of all, we'd got our democracy back. That's what getting back sovereignty means. Our own Westminster MPs would once again have the sole power to run our government, a power they've now abandoned to the EU. And we, the citizens, through our right to hire and fire them, would get back control of our own government. After withdrawal, what happens? We continue as members of the United Nations, of NATO, of the Commonwealth, of the World Bank, and so on. We make it clear to the rest of the EU that they are our friends and allies. We keep free trade and free movement of capital with the rest of the EU because they'll be desperate to keep on selling us BMWs and Renaults and Camembert cheese. We're their biggest single customer worldwide. They sell us far more than we sell them, which means that more of their jobs depend on trade with us than on the other way around. Finally, how do we get out? It's simpler than you'd think. First, we get the support of the British people in a referendum, and then we repeal the 1972 European Communities Act, by which we joined the then common market. That's all we have to do. The rest is detail. There is much more we could have told you about the European Union. The fact that it operates a system of bookkeeping enabling massive and continuing fraud resulting in its own auditors failing to accept and sign off the books of account for any of the years since 1994. The fact that all the important decisions affecting you and I are taken behind closed doors in total secrecy and the fact that all the people who make those decisions are unelected to those positions, unaccountable to anyone and largely unknown. But time does not permit. Whatever happens from now on depends very much on you. You must make up your mind as to what kind of country you want to live in and in which your children can grow in freedom. If you are disturbed or concerned by what you've seen in this film, please don't take our word for it. Check it out for yourself. A list of books, pamphlets and other sources are included at the end of this film. Vladimir Bukovsky spent a total of 12 years in Russian psychiatric prisons and labour camps for defending human rights during the 1960s and 1970s. His last period of imprisonment was in 1971. He came to the West in 1976 and now lives in Cambridge. He has experienced firsthand a system which he considers ominously similar to the one being imposed upon us. If he is right, then the Britain you and I know truly is on the brink of extinction. It is really puzzling to me that having just buried one monster, the Soviet Union, another remarkably similar one, the European Union, is being built. Exactly what is the European Union? Perhaps by examining the Soviet version we can get the answer. The Soviet Union was governed by 15 unelected people who appointed each other and who were not accountable to anyone. The European Union is governed by two dozen people who appoint each other, meet in secret and are not accountable to anyone and whom we cannot sack. One might say that the EU has an elected parliament. Well, the Soviet Union had a parliament of a sort too, the Supreme Soviet. We just rubber stamped the Politburo decisions. Pretty much like the European Parliament does, where speaking time in the chamber is limited within each group and often amounts to one minute per, per speaker. In the EU, there are hundreds of thousands of Eurocrats with their huge salaries, their staff, servants, bonuses and privileges, their lifelong immunity from prosecution, which is simply shuffled from one position to another, no matter what they do, or failed to do. Is this not exactly like the Soviet regime? The Soviet Union was created by coercion and very often with a military occupation. The European Union is being created admittedly not by armed force, but by coercion and economic bullying. In order to continue to exist, the Soviet Union spread itself further and further. The moment it stopped spreading, it started collapsing. And I suspect the same is true of the European Union. We were told that the purpose of the Soviet Union was to create a new historic entity, 
the Soviet people, and that we must forget our nationalities, our ethnic traditions and customs. The same seems to be true of the European Union. They don't want you to be British or French, they want you all to be a new historic entity, European, to suppress all your national feelings and live as a multinational community. After 73 years, the same system in the Soviet Union resulted in more ethnic conflict than anywhere in the world. In the Soviet Union, one of the grand purposes was the destruction of the nation-state. And that's exactly what we observe in Europe, in Europe today. Brussels intends to absorb nation-states so that they should cease to exist. Corruption was built into the Soviet system from top, to, uh, to, from top down, and so it is in the EU. The same endemic corruption activity that we saw in the old Soviet Union has flourished in the EU. Those who oppose or expose it are silenced or punished. Nothing changes. In the Soviet Union we had a gulag. I think we have a gulag in the European Union also. also an intellectual gulag known as political correctness. When anyone tries to speak their mind on questions of race or gender, or if their views differ from those approved, they will be ostracized. This is the beginning of the gulag, the beginning of your loss of freedom. In the Soviet Union, they told us we needed a federal state to avoid war. In the European Union, they are telling you exactly the same thing. In short, the same ideology underpins both systems. The EU is an old Soviet model presented in Western guise. But again, like the Soviet Union, the European Union has within itself the seeds of its own demise. Unfortunately, when it collapses, and it will, it will leave immense destruction behind and we will be left with huge economic and ethnic problems. The old Soviet system was incapable of reform so is the European Union, but there is an alternative to being ruled by those two dozen self-appointed officials in Brussels. It is called independence. You don't have to accept what they have planned for you. After all, you have never been asked if you wanted to join. I have lived in your future, and it didn't work.